So which way are we rolling? I don't have a goddamn clue. <laughs> don't worry. They'll roll for a month before they figure out I'm faking it. But, um, what? what? Oh, you want details. Well, I'm not telling these savages that we haven't solved the map yet. They're like mushrooms. Feed them shit and keep them in the dark. Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 145 and 146, which begin with the smokers cheering as Deacon shows the Manola, and end with Deacon reveling in his followers' blind devotion. This week we kick off with Deacon exclaiming to his followers that Enola is their guide in the wild, their beacon in the darkness. Right off the bat, he is leaning heavily on that biblical imagery because guide in the wild, beacon in the darkness, I don't know about you, but that reminds me very distinctly of Exodus chapter 13, where it is said in plain words that the Lord went before the children of Israel as a pillar of a cloud by day, and by night a pillar of fire, to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. It does make me wonder if they have a Bible, or if they have remnants of a Bible, or if it's oral tradition passed down, these concepts of a beacon in the wild. Now, this may be... A conversation that I'm remembering from a previous season of the show, but we've discussed in the past how the Bible is one of the most printed pieces of literature in the world. Yeah, I remember having that conversation, and I also can't remember what movie it was that it came up in. If you were a betting person and were putting in wagers as to what literature survives a deluge that covers most of the world in water, what books would survive, you would be wise to bet on at least one copy of the Bible surviving. Yeah, it's just a numbers game. Sheer percentages. There's a really good chance of a Bible in some form a surviving. A copy of Harry Potter surviving. <laughs> uh, it does not surprise me at all that someone who calls himself the deacon would pull inspiration from the Christian Bible. Although Exodus is arguably a story that you'll also find in Jewish texts as well. But either way, he is equating Enola with that guiding force, that idea that you have a figure that you have to follow by faith. It's just there, and you've got to follow it, and you've got to believe that it's going to lead you in the right direction. Right. Equating that with the conversation that happens towards the end of these two minutes of the, oh, oh, I, I actually have no idea what's going on, but they don't need to know that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's very much like he's using their blind faith, but it's actually more ignorance against them well, it's like for I his favor, for his benefit. I called it devotion in my episode intro. That's what I believe that these smokers have to the deacon. They have devoted their lives to him blindly. Yeah. He's promised Dryland for years. You had a naysayer in the crowd who was like, yeah, hey, you've been saying that for a long time. When are you going to deliver? I'd really love to get some insight on just an average smoker. <laughs> and like, why are you here? Where did you come from? How did you come to be here? Why are you still here? What do you expect the future to look like? Yeah, I think this movie skims over the smokers and leaves a lot to be wondered about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said for a group that flexes their power, that goes around showing off, that will attract certain people say, oh, well, if they're the biggest and strongest in the neighborhood, I'm going to throw in my lots with them. There's also a lot to be said for people growing up in a society and just sticking with it. If you're born a smoker, because they are the church of eternal growth and they are constantly growing their congregation, if you grow up in it, you might as well just stay in it. You're not going to just 
up and decide to leave one day because you've been a smoker all your life. Try and go to an atoll, they'll be like, oh, what are you? And you'd be like, well, I was a smoker. And they'll be like, oh, he's a smoker. Kill him. Right. It's kind of something that sticks with you. Yeah. Unless you're crafty like the Nord and can just pass as a traitor. I do kind of feel like that's a cleanliness comparison. Like the average smoker, we've gotten a pretty good look at the masses and they are filthy. But the Nord is clean Mm -hmm. and well-groomed. So, yeah, I think if an average smoker could clean themselves up and be presentable, then they can go out into the world and pass as just a trader, a traveler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then they'd miss out on the opportunity to follow this path that the deacon is so adamant that they are going to follow. It's really impressive, not really surprising, But impressive how he has gotten them riled up. We also don't hear most of his speech. Right. Quite a bit of it is just fuzz in the background. We can't really make out what he's saying. But he's spoken to them a lot. We hear little bits and pieces. And they are completely on board. It's the sort of moment where you kind of get it. Like the deacon is very charismatic and... We have to assume that the off-screen speech was also very charismatic. Mm -hmm. So it's not really surprising that he gets the kind of reaction out of them that he does. And there's also, I don't want to call it a sunk cost fallacy Uh... that the smokers have, but they have devoted their life, their energy, their day-in, day-out efforts to this man. And so if he is really enthusiastic about something and selling it to them, they are going to be invested and getting excited about what that leader is saying. I think sunk cost fallacy is actually a really good way to look at it because from their point of view, based on what they're being told right now, they're really close to the end. Mm -hmm. So they've put in X amount of work. They might as well go the last 10%. What they don't know is that they're not at the last 10%. They're nowhere. (laughs) They're nowhere. They're still at zero. Yeah. And that's a fact that he's hiding from them. I do get a bit of a chuckle from Deacon telling Nord to turn around so that way he can lift up Enola's shirt and show them the tattoo. There's no way that anybody on that deck can actually see the tattoo. No, they can barely even see Enola. But the implication that that's what he's showing them gets them riled up once more. Yeah, I think it's another stand-in for Faith. Mm -hmm. I am telling you this is what I'm showing you, even though you can't see it. But you're excited anyways, because I told you that's what I'm showing you. Yeah, if Deacon was a true huckster, he probably just could have grabbed any old kid from any old atoll. Right. Put something on her back and said, oh, yeah, you should continue following me because I found this golden child and keep them going for another couple of months or so. Right. And there does seem to be this sense of he has to do something to satisfy them. Things are getting to a point where... They're not going so hot on the ship. And he needs to produce something, some sort of result. And if he hadn't been able to produce the actual real girl in this moment, I have no doubt that he would have produced something fake to quell the crowd. Yeah, he had to cancel the tractor pulls. You know how much of a social upheaval that caused? I'm sure. I am sure. (laughs) There is a moment that I just kind of want to point out real quick. It's during the Deacon's speech when Enola is still facing forward. It's like her first look out to the crowd. And her expression is mildly surprised. I think she's a little shocked to see so many people on this ship and in his group. I'm not sure that she really had a sense of the size of the smokers. And she seems like, oh, okay, this is a lot of people. Yeah, when the deacon described his congregation to her, she had no concept of this many people because she grew up on an atoll. It's a very small, contained environment. It's like when someone from a small town in Iowa goes to New York City for the first time and they're like, oh, wow, I've never seen this many people all in one place before. Yeah. From a town of 500, and now I come to a (laughs) town of 5 million. Right. After Deacon has shown off Enola to the crowd, he lets Nord put her down and set her aside. And he says, and now the holy most moment is upon us. Let us sacrifice one to St. Joe. And he takes a bottle of Jack Daniels and he smashes it against the railing. And that made me think of the 
tradition of christening ships before they leave the dry dock for the first time. Yes, very much so. So I looked up an article about the history of why bottles of champagne are smashed against the bow when okay. you launch a ship. The tradition of christening a new ship. Or, so this article comes from mentalfloss.com. I know you watch a bunch of their YouTube videos from mm-hmm. time to time, so you'll be familiar with these folks. The tradition of christening a new ship for good luck and safe travel goes way back. Many ancient seafaring societies had their own ceremonies for launching a new ship. The Greeks wore olive branch reeds around their heads, drank wine to honor the gods, and poured water on the new boat to bless it. The Babylonians sacrificed an ox, the Turks sacrificed a sheep, and the Vikings and Tahitians offered up human blood. These events almost always had a religious tone to them, and the names of a favored god or god of the seas was often invoked. In the Middle Ages, two friars would often board British ships before the maiden voyage to pray, lay their hands on the mass, and sprinkle holy water on the deck and bow. Ship christening in the young United States borrowed from contemporary English tradition. The launch of the USS Constitution in 1797 included the captain breaking a bottle of Madeira wine on its bow. Over the next century, the ritual of breaking or pouring some christening fluid remained, but the fluid itself varied wildly. The USS Princeton, Raritan, and Shamrock were all christened with whiskey. The USS New Ironsides was double christened, first with a bottle of brandy and then with Madeira. Other ships were teetotalers and launched with water or grape juice. The USS Hartford was christened three times with water from the Atlantic Ocean, the Connecticut River, and the Hartford Spring. The USS Kentucky was launched with spring water by her official sponsor. But as the battleship slipped into the water, onlookers gave her a baptism more fitting of her namesake state and bashed small bottles of bourbon against her sides. Nice. I like the idea of it being customized to the ship. Yeah. So... There were instances of ship launches during Prohibition where the ships went sober again. They used water, juice, and apple cider and things like that. Champagne came back with the passage of the 21st Amendment that got rid of Prohibition. Apparently, the widespread use of champagne came into vogue when the Secretary of the Navy's granddaughter christened the USS Maine, the Navy's first steel battleship, in 1890. So I guess the shift from wood to steel ships and the power and elegance associated with champagne was one of the reasons they chose it to christen the battleship with. Okay, nice. It's one of those things where it started off religious, went a little secular, and now people have fun with it. I know there's that scene in Caddyshack where the rich guy is about to launch his new sailing yacht and he wants to bash the bottle against it. Then Rodney Dangerfield comes in with his much bigger yacht and drops an anchor through his deck. (laughs) I'm not sure where this image comes from in my head, but maybe it's from a movie of the smashing of the bottle and the bottle won't break. Oh, yeah. That has to be a common comedic upset of the tradition. That sounds right. Yeah, it does seem like it's probably pretty common. And nowadays, I don't know when we made this transition, but nowadays, instead of someone holding the bottle in their hand, it's on the pendulum. You just kind of let it go, and it swings and hits the ship. Depending on the size of the ship, sometimes you can't even get close to the bow. Right. (laughs) So with the bottle smashed and the voyage christened, Deacon pulls a handgun from his jacket. He says, and let's get this tub of up to speed and he fires a shot in the air and all of the smokers whoop holler and rush to their not battle stations but to their appointed areas and i like how you've got the deacon firing in the air you got his smokers firing in the air the doctor and the ledger guy go over to a gun case that's going to be very important later on pull some flare guns out and they're shooting flares it's a big old hoot nanny situation yeah i guess this is how they celebrate in, yeah. in a society filled with firearms, how else are you going to celebrate? Right. Now, the flares did feel specific. It felt like their assignment, once the deacons gave the go-ahead, was to go shoot off those flares, and that those flares have a specific message. Maybe the flares are used specifically for, hey, let's or out of here, everybody to your or stations. Well, no, he's on a speaker. Everybody should be able to hear him. I don't know, but the flares felt specific. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind, because there's a section of the book I want to read later on in this episode that may have something to do with the flares. Okay, excellent. But before we get to that point, we get 
several shots of smokers running across the deck, leaping into these big old holes in the deck, sliding down fireman poles to get to their stations. It's an interesting way for them to move about the Ds, that they have cut these massive holes in the deck that they can just jump into. Yeah, okay, sliding down the poles, I was like, yeah, cool, that seems like a very effective way to get to your station quickly. And then there was a couple people who literally just jumped into the hole. Yeah, seems a little risky. Yeah, and we can see where the oars are positioned right above that barnacle line. So that's a big jump. There must be other walkways that you can jump to or maybe chains or ropes that you can hold on to to help you swing to different parts of the boat. Yeah, there must be. In that case, it would have been fun to see that a little bit. Although it's entirely possible that we do because we see a lot of below decks activity. It's a flurry of activity. And there are multiple levels of oarsmen because you've got one group that seem to be in the generic corridors of the ship and there's other oarsmen that seem to be in very specific rowing chambers and they have these walkways set up three oarsmen to an oar and they have three pathways in parallel and they just walk back and forth as they pull these oars the manual labor involved with being an oarsman is insane they have to physically walk back and forth a good couple of feet like i don't know maybe about four or five feet in unison with Two other people on the same oar as you. With a crappy, what do you call the beat keeper? Coxswain. Thank you. Is that the same term? Because I know that that's for when you're rowing crew. The person at the front of the boat is a coxswain. But is that the same term as like an interior? I have not found any alternative titles okay. for someone who calls out the rowing pace. Okay, because it seems like it could be two different terms. For these two different scenarios, but same job, keeping the beat. And he's really bad at it. So he's yelling out stroke, which is the typical way that the coxswain does it, is on a regular beat, stroke, stroke, stroke. And then you got somebody else yelling out pull in a rhythm of some fashion. I don't know. It's just crap. They don't know how to do this. Would you expect any more organization from a group like the Smokers? Like, how hard is it to get a freaking drum? Well, the thing is... These oars are so massive, and the strokes are so large because the oars are so long. You've got to give the person on the very outside time to walk the full distance. That's true. I hadn't even thought of that, that the person on the outside has to do more movement than the person on the inside. It's an interesting trade-off because the length of the lever, they are not having to pull on that oar with as much strength because they have the leverage of the rest of that oar, but they're also walking farther. Whereas the person on the inside of the oar, because their lever is the shortest, they're pulling with more strength, but they have to walk with less distance. That leads me to wonder if people are strategically placed. Oh, like, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Yeah, if like the tanks are on the inside yeah. and the runners are on the outside hmm. playing to their strengths. Okay, if this organization is sophisticated enough to specifically put people in the best place for their physical abilities, then they ought to be able to do a better job on the pacing. And it baffles me because the coxswain is so crappy, but we see a good couple of strokes from the interior and everybody is in unison. It's working. Yeah. Why it's working, no idea, but it's working. Well, he calls out... Okay, begin your stroke now, and then everybody has to pull in unison. It's a slow and methodical process, and as the ship begins to move, it is very slow. Yeah. Very methodical. And the coxswain has nothing to do with that. His calling out stroke does not match their strokes. <laughs> They're on their own, so there's no reason for them to be in unison. I did a little bit of reading about oars, meaning that I looked up oars on Wikipedia, this is what the article had to say about the oar. The oar is placed in the pivot point with the short portion inside the vessel and a much longer portion outside. The rower pulls on the short end of the oar while the long end is in the water. The oar is a second-class lever with the water as the fulcrum, the oarlock as the load, and the rower as the force. 
force being applied to the oar lock by exertion of pressure against the water. An oar is an unusual lever, since the mechanical advantage is less than one. The oar increases the small displacement of the end by the rower into a large displacement of the vessel through the water. The rower applies a large force through a small distance, which must be equaled by the small force the water applies operating over the longer distance, i.e. the work done by the rower must be balanced by the work done by the water. That being said, such a large vessel with such a prodigious amount of growth on the underside of its hull could never, even with all of these oars, move in this way. It does seem like a tall order. Just visually, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. So with that in mind, I want to duck into the book because I believe that Max Allen Collins, as he was writing this novelization, realized, okay, the idea of rowing the Ds with a bunch of oars is far too ridiculous, so I'm going to fix that somehow. Outside, cables began to stretch from the looming ship's bow to tugboats, whose engines whined and groaned and bitched and moaned, but finally cranked over, props churning water, straining under the sheer tonnage of their burden, the biggest scow in Waterworld. And the tugs weren't enough, the vast ship remaining motionless until through rusted-out holes from stern to stern, just above the waterline, oars extended, grabbing water. In the lower level of the Ds, the ship's willing galley slaves, smokers everywhere, manning, sharing the massive oars, with the smallest and loudest of the smokers sitting at their head, shouting at them through a conical device, And Staroke! And Staroke they did, one vast human dynamo, mighty morons in perfect unison, as for the first time in centuries, the Valdez left port. You said for the first time in centuries? Mm-hmm. Interesting. So it's like they had a plan for how to move it, although they had never actually done it before. Huh. Okay, I like the idea of tugboats and the oars working together. That makes more sense physics-wise. Also in the movie, we know that they've got a number of large ships, but they're nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. We know that there is an interior space for the jet skis, which is great because they're small. They're not really meant to traverse water on their own. But where are all those other boats? It makes a lot of sense to rig them up to help pull. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really like that explanation. Yeah. For the people reading the novelization, you can sit there and think, okay, I can accept that. It still is rather implausible, rather ridiculous to think of, but it makes it a little bit easier to swallow. For sure. We're going to leave the rowers behind as we cut back up to the bridge where the deacon is lighting a cigarette after his rising speech. I like that he lights that strike anywhere match using Enola's face because that just highlights how much of a bad dude he is. Yeah. So strike anywhere matches. So I get that they're strike anywhere, but doesn't there need to be some sort of friction? Uh Uh-huh. And skin doesn't really seem to be able to provide that friction. Not in my experience. I've seen people use strike anywhere matches with a fingernail, like they flick it a certain way and it ignites. Right. I have never been able to duplicate that. Right. Because all you have to do is on a match head, there's like an outer layer of protective material. All you have to do is scrape that away. And then underneath that is something that reacts with oxygen to sort of thing that flares up, lights a flame. So all you have to do is break through that outer layer. But yeah, not on skin, you're not. <laughs> You need something hard like wood or a classic image is the bottom of your boot. Hmm. Or a bunch of rusted metal. Perfect. That would be perfect. (laughs) The doctor raises an interesting question. He says, so which way are we rowing? And the deacon responds by saying that he doesn't have a goddamn clue. But he assures his lieutenant not to worry because... The smokers below deck will row for a month before they figure out that the deacon is faking it. The tone with which he delivers these lines is just so looking down upon the smokers. Mm -hmm. Like, they are stupid, I am smart, and so I win. (laughs) And should anything happen to them, there's plenty more where they came from. It's just like Ed, the tail gunner from the scout plane. Yes. The doctor asks deacon, but, um, why? And... 
I had to stop for a moment because on a ship, the captain's word is law. I've been reading the Robin Hobb Live Ship Traders series of books, and it's very old-timey narratime tradition, but the idea is that like when the captain tells you to do something, you don't question, you just do it. The sailor's job is to obey, to make sure things happen and get working. And so all of the regular smokers are doing just that. The captain has said, get rowing, and so they get rowing. And you've got this lieutenant in the doctor who's questioning his leader, and that's not really his place. I mean, the deacon doesn't seem upset by that question. No. So I think the Nord and the doctor, and probably the ledger guy as well, have enough clout with the deacon to be able to raise questions like this. Yeah. There's the benefit of them being in private. They're not in front of the crew. That's really, really important that he's not questioning the leader in front of the rabble. Mm -hmm. But Deacon tells him, I'm not telling these savages that we haven't solved the map yet. I promise them results. And then the clip ends. Is this the first time in the movie that we've heard the Deacon speak about the masses in such a way? With such little respect, I guess? Out loud, probably. Yeah. I'm not recalling any other instance where he spoke generically so disdainfully of his people. Yeah. For the most part, he hasn't really addressed their existence much at all. Yeah. So this felt a little bit surprising to me. And a little bit of tonal shift from him. It's not like before now I thought he had a particular respect for his people. He had just never voiced a particular disrespect for his people the Mm. way he has in these last few lines. So it's a matter of subtext becoming text. Yeah, definitely. It's a good progression for his character. I think his character has become more and more disdainful as the movie has progressed. Maybe more overtly disdainful. To say nothing of him riding high on the success of being closer to finding dry land than he ever has been. So I guess he's getting more cocky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And perhaps that's where this blatant derision comes from, is from his cockiness, Mm -hmm. because he is moving in the right direction, even though he's not. He's pretending that he is. (laughs) So we're going to see this cockiness from the Deacon continue into next week's episode. Come back next time. Deacon notices that one of his worker bees isn't buzzing. Enola delights in the arrival of her rescuer and the Mariner threatens to hold the ship for ransom. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tui, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of danielbatista.com. Our home on the internet is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute. And like us on Facebook by searching Mad Max Minute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit patreon.com slash madmaxmin. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld episode 73. We'll see you next time.